Uh, my name is David Bianco. I'm a security technologist at Squirrel. That is a secret code for I've done incident response and incident uh, detection for a long time, and so I kind of tell the company how to do it and how the product should do it. Uh, Chris here is our director of data science. You want to say something about yourself? Um, yeah, I have a background in math and computer science, and I uh, worked for a long time on uh, you know, killer drones and stuff, and then they, uh, they put me on to you know, doing uh, social network analysis for the National Security Agency. So I'm like super evil, and then now I work for Squirrel. <laughs> But he says it in the chillest way possible. Like <laughs> super evil. Um, yeah, so I want to say, first of all, as a security subject matter expert, it's like an incident detection guy, right? I never really, before I came to Squirrel, got that much into the data science aspects of it. It was like always like, uh, you know, write new signatures or new, poli new grow policies or something like that. Do some network forensics, some post forensics to trace down things. But when I came to uh, Squirrel, we do big data security analytics, and uh, uh, now I made our marketing people very happy. Um, so I started learning more about the data science aspects of it, uh, especially the machine learning piece. And I think the machine learning is actually something that I was really excited to be able to come and talk to you guys today, because I think it's a tool that probably most of us probably don't think that we are ready to use. But in fact, it is so super simple to get started, and you can start making your computers actually give you some intelligent results. I will say, this is a, something that Chris told me, um, machine learning might seem like magic to you, but guess what? Somebody else has already cast that spell, and so all you have to do is use it. There is machine learning for Python or Ruby or whatever your favorite languages are. All that stuff is there and ready to go. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How you, as a possible non-probable non-machine learning expert, can actually get started applying machine learning to the jobs that you do every day to help you become more effective. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, it's, a lot of this is it's a combination of we're going to talk about the process of machine learning for incident detection. We're also releasing a tool, uh, a demo tool, that you will be able to go and say, either you, know, you run it as is to find, do some machine learning against your HTTP proxy logs to find evil, or possibly adapt it to some other logs or even other processes that you have where you want to do some uh, what we call binary classification. And we'll get into this a little bit later. So when's the last time you heard this? It's best practice to review your logs every day. Who's ever heard that? Raise your hand. All right, now, raise them high and keep them up. Raise them high and keep them up, come on. All right, now, take your hands down if you are still able to do that today. You, re you re review all your logs every day. There's, only, there's a lot fewer hands up now, right? And why is that? Well, of course, we have too many logs today. Too many different types, too many instances of the same log type is just not a feasible thing to do. Although it really is good advice, if you were able to review all your logs, put a human in front of them that could actually pay attention and concentrate enough to see the, all the logs that they had and find evil things in them, you probably would get pretty good results, but you can't. That's where this idea of machine-assisted analysis comes in, or probably what I should have called this talk, practical cyborgism or security operations. Computers are really good at some things, and humans are really good at others. This is almost cliche, right? Computers are good at um, uh, you know, repetition tasks, large-scale tasks, do the same thing 100,000 or a million times. They do it quickly. Uh, the algorithms, I say algorithms work cheap. You don't pay, they don't take six days, whatever. Um, but they are terrible at the things that we're good at, which is context and understanding humans are so good at finding patterns in data that we are even a little bit too sensitive and we find Elvis on post. Like where that pattern does not actually exist, we actually can find it. Um, but we can take advantage of that. We also have curiosity and intuition that says, you know, this isn't quite right. Let's, let's follow this up. And we have, of course, business knowledge to know, hey, you know, these are maybe two business units that don't ever talk. They shouldn't talk. 
they're legally required not to talk. Why are they talking, right? But if you put those together, you can have that, that cyborg piece, the analyst and the human acting together more like one. So you get good results from a massive amount of data, and you can do it really quickly. So here's a practical example of this, a bro HTTP log. In this case, uh, this is uh, HTTP log from an outgoing, it's like H, uh, the equivalent of HTTP proxies, right? Um, analysts in this room probably already found out that they think this is probably a suspicious or malicious traffic because they probably looked, just my guess, they probably looked at post and then this domain name that nobody can remember or type. I always train my new analysts that if you see a domain that you can't remember it and type it, think of it as suspicious. With a few examples, or a few exceptions of like uh, in totally internal things like content distribution networks or something like that. Um, these shorter domains though are supposed to be things people remember and type. They put them in ads or they, you know, whatever. Clearly, no one's going to remember or be able to type that correctly. So it makes it a little bit suspicious. It's easy, it took me far longer to tell you about why I thought that than it took me to read that and decide it was bad. On the other hand, what happens if you're like this? You get this many. This is only one screen out of a whole day's worth of data. You can't really do that. It's hard. You get too many logs. So the solution is to get rid of some of the logs. So that's why we call our our solution is called ClearCut <clears throat> because we we got rid of a lot, a lot of the logs and we found the bad logs right here remaining. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over here to Chris to talk about this the background and the data science pieces inside ClearCut and then I'll be back. In Stated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we're doing some of the machine learning stuff. Um, again, like all these things are built into libraries, and we're just using them. I'm pulling the covers a little bit back on the algorithms, uh, mainly to show you how to use them as an analyst. Because right? um, that's going to be some important stuff that you would want to do when you use this in uh, real life. So what we're using here is something called a binary classifier, which is a subclass of supervised learning algorithms. So uh, supervised learning algorithm, what, it, what it's trying to do is, you can't really see the colors too well in there, but um, so you're going to have a bunch of data, those are the dots, um, and you're going to have some dots that are orange and some dots that are blue, and uh, you know those in advance, so that's, those, that's your labeled data set. These are things that you know are orange and blue, and you want to try to make an algorithm, make a, uh, a model that can tell you if some gray dot that comes in is probably orange or probably blue. And um, that's why it's called a binary classifier, because there's two classes, orange and blue. Or in our case, maybe malicious and normal. Uh, a lot of times, people call these positives and negatives, depending on like, what the problem set is. Um, so we have here, uh, you know, one way to do this in two dimensions is to just draw a line between the two sets. And that's one type of classifier. It's a linear classifier. You know, some, some very well-known classifiers are basically drawing a line between your two sets. In some space, you know, there's some transformation, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, the machine can learn the function. And basically, there's, this is like a recipe for doing machine learning, right? Like, this is kind of, uh, you know, this isn't machine learning itself, but it's like what you do when you want to do machine learning on a set. You know, first, you want to identify those positive and negative sample data sets. You want to get a set of stuff that's blue and orange, right? Uh, you want to clean and normalize the data. You know, data is always messy. You learn this as a data scientist. If you ever work with real data, there's some data that you just want to throw away. Um, and you might want to add some things to the data that are helpful for doing this classification. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so we want to, after that, we'll take those, those dots that we know the color of. We're going to partition those dots into two sets, a training set and a, uh, and a testing set. And um, after we do that, you know, we're going to compute some features on this data set to do machine learning. We're going to train the model. So like, you know, computing the features is a little bit of the, of the stuff that you'd have to do yourself. We've done it for you in this, in this, in this, uh, in this tool that we've written. But if you want to do it on your own logs, you might have to do some of that. 
Uh, train a model, it's one line of Python. Test the model against the test data set to see how good it is. Oh no. That's also one line of Python. <laughs> it'll, it'll be off for a couple minutes and probably come back on. Oh my gosh. We can maybe force it. This is the stuff the machine does not want you to know. It's been happening all day. <laughs> By the way, the address at the top of the screen is if you will sign in the screen. Yeah, it, it's expecting that you will sign in with Google to be able to do that. But, you know, we'll also take live questions. So okay. if you don't want to sign in to Google to ask a question, that's fine. We just want it to be like if people were uh, shy about asking questions, uh, they didn't have to like, speak up. So train the model, one line of Python. Test the model, one line of Python. Evaluate the results, one line of Python. Drink beer, maybe one line of Python becomes three or four. Uh, <laughs> four beer. Beer. And then you're done. And you can go use that trained model on real data and start classifying it. Uh, so this is just a picture of one of those steps. We're going to take our data. So the data that we've taken in this example is from uh, Contagio and some other sources of malicious data. We're going to get the pro HTTP log version of that. Uh, for the normal data, we've taken some data in our network. Uh, for our examples, and uh, you know, we've, we've done the same thing. We're through row. We get all the label data. We're going to split it, split it into a <coughs> bigger training set and a smaller test set. So feature extraction. So th this is where it starts to get interesting for some uh, for for you guys. Um, we want to ex give the machine as much of a chance as it can to figure things out. Now we don't have to be perfect. Um, I think David mentioned before that he looked at that top level domain or that domain and said, "This looks weird." Why does that look weird? So we can use our, our domain knowledge to help out the machine a little bit. It's a little bit hard for the machine to just take things as is, boil the ocean, and be like, yeah, this is malicious. So we're going to give it a little bit of help by <clears throat> computing some features on the data uh, that can help it out. So we're going to do things like take that domain name and compute how likely it is that it's English. Just We call that the entropy. Right? Um, so the, these, uh, these these machine learning algorithms, especially the, uh, the random force that we're going to use, it wants everything to be in numeric form, a number, right? And you saw that <coughs> that record was not numeric in general. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of strings, HTTP strings. Uh, there's things like HTTP codes, which are numeric, but they're not really numeric in the way that the tree algorithm wants it to be numeric. And that, like, code 400 is not twice as much as code 200, right? That doesn't make sense to the machine learning algorithm. So those are really enumerated types, right? So we want to, uh, for enumerated types and strings, we're going to use this method uh, that's widely used in uh, natural language processing called bags, bag of words, bag of engrams. <clears throat> what we're going to do is take these string features and enumerated type features and form a bag of all of them. So the bag is, it has a column of data, and the column is, OK, this record was code 400, or it wasn't. So if it's code 400, it's a 1. Code four, it's not code 400, it's a 0. So that's the bag, and there's one for each code in HTTP codes. And we're going to convert that one column in the original data to <coughs> how many codes there are. Uh, sound good? Uh, same thing with uh, string data. We're going to use this n-grams thing. So we're going to pass a window over the string and, for example, here in the picture on the right, there's five grams. So every five characters, it's going to be a different bag. So if the T-H-E space Q is present in our string, we're going to have a one in that bag. And if that happens again in the same string, maybe we count it up to a two. <clears throat> so this actually produces quite a few columns if you just do it for every single bag, right? Uh, we want to have a way to like maybe reduce it because uh, the running time of the algorithm is proportional to the number of columns you have. So we're going to use this technique called uh, TF-IDF to determine which of these columns we really do care about. And what, it, what that's, uh, that's another text processing technique that says, okay, so it's sort of the most rarest things that have the most informational content. It can determine that from the training data and only keep those columns. And later on, when we uh, pass through test data or production data, it'll only look for those bags and all the other bags that are throw away. <clears throat> so we kind of want to give the, the machine an idea of the things that could be important. And we think that 
you know, the different codes, the engrams and the strings, the entropy, things like the number of dots in the uh, domain name. These are all important things we don't know for sure. We have hints. We want to give them, the machine those hints, and the machine can then work it out. How does it do that? <coughs> um, so we're using Random Forest. I'm going to have two slides in Random Forest. I'll try to I hope I don't put you guys to sleep or anything. This is the magic part, right? Like, you don't have to program this. This is already done. But just to show you what's happening. Um, a random forest is a bunch of decision trees put together. What's a decision tree? A decision tree is you take a log, and you ask a bunch of questions about it. And <clears throat> at each point, it's a yes or no question, or maybe a greater than less than question. And depending on the answer to that question, you either go left or right in the tree. And the leaves are predictions. So in this decision tree on the left here, so that data, that decision tree that you saw a second ago was based on uh, Titanic survivor data. So the first question asked was, are you a man, are you a woman? If you're a woman, you have a high probability of survival. So at that point, uh, it figures out that no other column has enough information to give you any better answer than survive. <coughs> um, but if you're on, the, if you're on the, the male side, some other questions could provide uh, more information right. for that uh, decision. So like whether or not you were a young male or an older male over age nine and a half, that could give you a little bit more information and give you a better answer. Uh, so that's how they work once you have them. Um, there's various techniques to create them. Uh, pretty much, there's like a greedy method. The greedy method is like the most widely used. You take your corpus of data, you uh, <clears throat> try to find the column that gives you the most informational content for the answer that you're looking for, and you make that your first question. So it's sort of a greedy way. And uh, then you split, the, you split the data set on that, <clears throat> on that uh, question, whether or not you know, sex is male or female, and then you do the same thing over again, and until you meet some threshold of information content. <coughs> this can be very good at fitting, fitting a model to a particular set of data, but it has a problem that it could be, it could fit it too well, and that's what we call overfitting. So if we try to apply this model to another set of data that has gray dots, it might have asked questions that maybe aren't meaningful for like a real data set because you just didn't have enough data. So that's what we call overfitting, and it'll give you wrong answers in that case. So one way we mitigate this is uh, a technique called random forest. So basically we build a bunch of these trees and then ask them to vote. And the vote is a better answer than in any individual tree. What's random about them? It's really pretty simple. There's two random things. You train each individual tree on a random subset of the data that you select uh, with replacement. And for each individual tree that you train, you select a random subset of the columns. So you ignore maybe most of the columns in each individual tree. And you do that n times, and you form a classifier by averaging, or you know, uh, you, you can also have voting. Uh, it turns out this is a really good classifier. It's called a bagging technique for uh, Ensembles of classifiers. So we've written uh, we've written some scripts to do this uh, on HTTP log data, and I'll let David describe how they're run. Actually, I'd also like to just point out we chose random forest because it's probably the best one if you don't know what algorithm you should use because there's a ton of other ones. Because it's really super good at just figuring out based on all the features that you threw at it. So. Um, and it's also probably the most, one of the most popular ones, so you're likely to find it even if you're not a Python person. If you like something else, there's probably a random forest implementation that you could use. We're going to talk about training, testing the model, and then uh, running your, your own data through it. Um, we're also going to talk about that in terms of like how you do it in theory and in general, but also uh, at the same time how our tool how you use our tool to do that. So here you see the first step is we have to train. So we have our tool consuming bro format HTTP logs, right? Nothing magic about that. You could change that if you wanted to, but that's what we do because right? we have a lot of bro data in the game. 
the first step is to just run the training algorithm with a sample of malware HTTP logs and a sample of our production, presumably, but not entirely verified, good logs. And I think this, you know, we, we run it with like dash O. So dash O means this is the bad stuff. And this is the good stuff. Uh, the good stuff, I think we had about one week. We just took one sample week of our logs. Um, and then that kind of came out to be some large number of uh, logs. The malware sample is of roughly 37,000 samples, I think. That's actually in the GitHub repo. I didn't provide our own logs. You have to provide your own normal traffic. The malware sample is in the GitHub repo. And uh, that's roughly 37. So we kind of um, redemand this way. You, when it says building vectorizers, it's actually creating all those features that Chris was just talking about, the bags of words and things like that. And then it does the training, as you just described, creates that random forest, creates a bunch of random trees in it. And then it actually spits out what you need for testing. So I'm going to skip ahead. So read the bros data into a pandas data frame. By the way, each one of those is, has a label on it. We, depending on which file it came from, we, we say it's either benign or malicious. Uh, we convert all the strings using bags of words. You can see bag of word, we do things like method and status code because those are um, like the status code, like Chris was saying, is basically an enumerated type. The, the HTTP method is also another enumerated type, get, post, whatever. And then ingrams uh, for other things like domains and user agents and whatever. We split it into about 80% training data and 20% test data and fed it through the random forest. At this point, it's noticed that we haven't really done anything with the test data set, that 20% that, that, that we reserved. But this is where it came, came to. Now we've made the trained model. We want to see how good our training is. So we took that test data, which is still labeled. Each thing is still labeled benign or malicious. And that way we know what the answer should be for each one of those, and we run them all through the trained model to see how good we are. And you can see here, just a little table that says, this is really class zero, so good, uh, sorry, bad. And uh, we predicted bad 12,428 times. So yay us, we predicted it was good only 15 times. Pretty good, right? We, made, uh, we said it's not gonna be perfect, but it'll be in the ballpark. And we did the opposite. It was known bad. We predicted it to be good only 19 times, and we predicted it to be bad uh, 9,563 times. So great. Is this a good model, though? I mean, you can kind of look at it with these numbers and say, yeah, this is a good model. But when you're trying to um, run this in your own environment, your numbers may not come out quite so clear. Also, if you want to experiment with some additional features or whatever that you might want to add, and you want to compare multiple runs, it's hard to compare a whole table. So what we've done is, uh, I think I have a slide on this, yes. We have com also computed this thing called the F1 score. And this is a standard kind of statistical score. You can see it in Wikipedia if you want, but it's, it's a mathematical combination of things like true positive rates and false positive rates and all these things to kind of give you a one number from zero to one, how good you think your, your model is. Anything over like 0.9 is considered to be good. Ours is actually suspiciously too good. Um, as Chris was mentioning, we might have some overfitting there. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But uh, technically we're over 0.9, so we, would, we might consider this to be a pretty good now, bonus, if you do the same thing and you add the dash B, it will take a little bit longer, but it will actually tell you the features that the random forest thinks are the most indicative of either way. It doesn't label them like this is more indicative of malicious and this is more indicative of non-malicious, but it just says these are the ones that count more. Um, and so, in and this may not surprise the malware analysts among you, user agents are often really influential. Because malware screws up the user agent a lot, 
or they might get a user agent that's totally legitimate but maybe not in your environment. Uh, but we also have other things like the user agent entropy, the, sub, the entropy of the subdomain, um, the, the body length of their response and their requests, so the number of domain or dots in the domain and things like that. And these are ranked. I mentioned something there. Yeah. So these are named like the feature type and then if it's say bag of words or engrams, <coughs> after the dot it's the actual engram. And um, also, This is at, this is the top fifty out of something like three thousand features. So yeah, these so are like these pretty, are pretty good. good. Yeah. Right. So the next thing is, and this will write a, a trained classifier out into by default your temp directory. If you actually go in the code, like give it dash h or look at the repo, it'll tell you how to um, put that somewhere more stable for production use. Um, but uh, here we actually the next step is just now we think we got a good model. We've trained it and tested it so, uh, and evaluated it. Now let's run it with some of our real data and see what we get. So that's what uh, Analyze Flows does. You just give it the name of another grow HTTP log. Uh, I, I designed this so you could basically do this every day with the previous days with the logs, or you could do something fancier. And it basically you know, loads it up calculates the features on the new log, because it obviously needs those features to run the machine learning. And then it analyzes it. It'll go for a little while. Um, and then it'll say, here, detected 298 anomalies out of 180,000 log entries. So I'm only having to, the machine is telling me I only have to look at 0.17% of all the logs that are in there. Which is really good. now. Who thinks that they can look at 180,000? No? Nope. Who thinks they can look at 298? Yeah. So now we're back, hopefully, into the realm where an analyst looking at the logs that they need to may again be possible, like it was 25 years ago. Sorry, is it 298 per hour, per five minutes, per day? This, is, this is a day log. So it was 298 log entries for the previous day. Yeah, it depends on the size of your network log. But it says, no, my network log had 180,000 in it in a day. We have a small office. If you're a larger company, you're going to have a lot more. And probably you will also have a lot more things to review. Um, but uh, hopefully it will still be in the, in the ballpark of things that you can do. And if it's not, you can tinker with the code add some more features or anything like that to help make it a little bit better. Uh, also bonus, this will take a lot longer if you run it, but it's kind of instructive to try it once or twice. If you run the same thing with dash B, it will tell you um, for each, each of the outputs why it thought that. Like what were the most influential features? So this is actually telling you these are the, the features that we took out of the bro log. By the way, if you want to go back to the original bro log, this is line 431 in the original bro log. So it can help you find it a little bit. Um, but then we said this is something you should look at because it's different than most of your logs. And it says, OK, user agent length was the most influential feature. This is the user agent length. That's the user agent right there. Um, so yeah, clearly that's a lot smaller than most real user agents. <coughs> uh, the response body link, the domain name link, uh, the user agent, these are all things like, as you might imagine, most of our office runs Mac OS. And most of the user agents have Mac OS in it. And this didn't have any of it. So it's saying, I expected to see these, didn't see any. But it's kind of interesting just to run it once or twice. It does take a substantially longer amount of time, by the way. So don't try to run it like that every day. And I'm going to turn it over back to Chris here for a few more slides. Yeah, so that, that's actually one of the pretty cool things about Random Forest and, uh, and uh, you know, decision trees is that they are one of the more explainable types of models that, that are out there. Some are just like you know, deep learning. It's like, you know, I have this like crazy function. Um, so there's one, one feature that we had, I don't know how much I want to go through this like in detail, but um, so if you don't have 
malware samples or you don't trust our malware samples. Um, you, can, you can also run a, a, a binary classifier with just one class of data. And there's various ways to do that. Um, so we call this one class classification because you're trying to fit a model just to the normal data and trying to like find other abnormal data. Now one way to do that is just like generate gibberish. Um, that's generally not as good as doing this other way called noise contrastive estimation. So what we're going to do is create fake data and call it malicious. And that fake data is going to be generated from the real data but have certain properties that make it look not realistic. So like an example is this Camera over here. If I have a classifier that's trying to classify animals, I'm going to like generate this thing that has a lion's head and, and a snake's tail. And uh, NCE is actually pretty much like this with logs. I'm going to jam different pieces of logs, real logs together and say, this is malicious, but it'll, it'll end up being able to classify your normal data um, better than just like random stuff. So we have this, if you don't pass in a, a malware file on the command line, that's an option, it's, it had that minus O option, it'll do this automatically so you can see how that works. If you look at the source, but it'll just produce a, a classifier using this automatically. So that's one nice thing. The, uh, the, the, the normal data file is not uh, optional, so it doesn't have a flag. So um, obviously, like, you know, this is something that we made for you guys to show, you know, how, uh, how sort of easy it is to, to produce something like this. It's not perfect. Uh, there's some things that could definitely be improved about it. Um, you know, more diverse malware samples, is the better data that you have to start out with, the better orange and blue data, the better your classifier is going to be. So that's almost always true. Um, so, you know, better data, better, better classifier. Can I say something about that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That, when I said that we might have had a suspiciously high F1 score, all of our malware samples mostly were Windows malware samples. And our office being mostly Macs, um, it was pretty easy for the classifier to tell the difference between those two. Um, when I say more diverse malware samples, I really mean we need to get some OS X malware in there, which we didn't have because it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of it in those archives. Yeah, the, uh, th there's a very old story, maybe apocryphal, about, um, you know, uh, about uh, binary classifiers where they were trying to train a uh, digital classifier to find pictures of tanks. And it was very good on their test set, but it turned out that like all the pictures of tanks were taken on a cloudy day, and all the pictures of not tanks were on a sunny day. So it was really like looking at the sky and saying, oh, that's a blue sky. So you made a blue sky classifier. And that's maybe kind of what we did. We made a blue sky Mac OS classifier. Um, so you have to be careful about that. But, uh, but that's data and not even really the code. Yeah, so. exactly, it's data. Um, so uh, there's some, some malware does things that is pretty normal, like uh, checking Google, checking maybe like a time server, I don't know, things like that. Um, that could throw off the classifier. So you could pre-filter, this is part of the uh, data cleaning check, you could pre-filter rows like that to make it not uh, affect the classifier as much because it's going to look too normal, things like that. So you can do cleaning steps. Um, <clears throat> there's actually, a, like in scikit-learn, the random forest uh, code allows for retraining the forest, and it's called warm starting. Uh, what, what you could do is, like, you know, your, your train model was on old malware data, old normal data, that eventually will become stale, like in our dynamic environment. So uh, <clears throat> there's ways to, like, take new normal data, new malware data, you could just, like, combine it with your old data and retrain or something from scratch, or you could do a new one from scratch. Um, but it could be helpful to take the old train model and use that as a warm start to your new train model. So there's ways to do that in Scikit. So that's another thing we could do. Uh, and it'd be nice to have, uh, you know, plugins for different log types. We're kind of like a little bit hard coded to do HTTP bro logs right now. Uh, it'd be nice to kind of have that in the plugin form where you could say like bro logs, whatever, or something else, uh, you know, HTTP uh, weird logs, things like that. Um, Another thing is like these things can not just do binary classification, but also K class classification, which means like uh, it would be able to maybe guess what kind of malware it is, uh, and or normal. So that's another thing that we yeah. added. Um, really, like uh, the main thing that would be nice to have is uh, you know different log types, because this is kind of like like I said, fixed to HTTP bro logs. Um, I kind of put a little recipe in here uh, for anybody that wants to tinker with the code. 
if you wanted to do different log types, these are the four steps that you'd have to take. There's like three file, three files that you'd have to change, and then four steps. Basically, like you have to read it in differently, and you have to generate features differently. Uh, so if you do this, it should work on like any other log types of data. I'm not going to go through those in great detail, but um, so now if you want to, if you wanted to ask us any other questions about that, uh, here's our contact information. And, um, uh, no, just to say that uh, there are Twitter handles are on here. I'll be tweeting out the link to the slides um, shortly, and also the GitHub URL is on here. It is. I will be flipping it over to a public repo uh, probably a few minutes after we, we are done up here. Um, so you know, within say an hour, all both of those things will be available, and uh, you can go to town. Also. Um, we, due to our AV difficulties, we lost all the questions. <laughs> if anybody submitted some through Google. So uh, I guess we're ready to take all of our questions in person. Uh, yes? Yeah, the real simple question. What, what type of uh, packages, uh, ML packages, do you use? So it's on the README. Uh, we use Pandas, Sidekit. Uh, there's a couple of um, random libraries for doing like top level domain extraction and stuff. In the README, it has a, a thing that tells you which packages you need to put install. There's one back there, too. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. So the first question has to do with correlating the anomalies that your classifier produces. So let's say you have one anomaly uh, and another anomaly. Uh, have you looked into how they can be correlated uh, in terms of uh, them belonging to, to the same attack? Uh, yeah, we didn't try to do that on this. So we're trying to keep it, it to a, like a one job kind of thing. Uh, in fact, you will notice that we actually, when we display it back to you through our tool, we don't actually tell you the, the IP addresses are on either side or anything like that. If you, because for the most part, and unless you're super owned, uh, most of these still probably going to be false positive. But uh, the ones that do look like a true positive should be pretty obvious, and then you could look those up if you want to. Um, if you want to do the, that kind of correlation, I'm afraid you have to buy Squirrel's product. <laughs> yeah, I expect there's going to be a lot of answers like that. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, the second question uh, uh, is about advanced or sorry, rather adversarial machine learning. Have you looked at the, the uh, uh, model drift aspect of, of the training of training a classifier and attackers who are adapting to um, to your your machine learning approach? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, they, there's, uh, like, retraining can help. But, yeah, it's, it's definitely, like, one of the, if not the most challenging problems in machine learning today because of that reason and because of other reasons. Like, you know, the, if you're trying to classify the type of an iris or whatever, one of the classic problems, the iris is not trying to look like a dandelion, right? Like, and that's not true here. So this is a, it's a very challenging problem. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Clearly, in your sample set, you train how to identify the micro that's a super agent. That's <laughs> great. Uh, two artifacts you had there. One is your, your feature extraction is really, really sparse, which I imagine, again, could lead you to a lot of faulty feature, feature selection. And the second is the fact that the sample set were roughly the same size. So in your training set, you have roughly the same number of samples in both classes. True Life, of course, has the benign traffic and orders of magnitude more than malicious traffic. Any loss, any loss function then it will tell you predicting no is the safest thing to say. Have you looked at these questions? Right, so I mean you can always, uh, that, that's why we're using like F1 score uh, to do evaluation partially because um, you know if you just use something like accuracy, accuracy is going to be very high if you just say no all the time, which is bad, right? Like so you really want to use something like F1 that takes the percentage of, uh, you know, it's it's actually the mean of, uh, of, of sensitivity and specificity. So that takes that into account, and uh, it's going to be low if you're doing things like saying yes all the time, saying no all the time. Um, but yeah, like, it, there's various ways to mitigate, like, you want to collect as much malicious traffic as you can, right, of course. Uh, you can use a combination of something like noise contrastive estimation with, like, your, your labeled data. You can, you can do both, so you can try to, like, you know, make uh, essentially fake malware Try to make the uh, the bound on the normal traffic as tight as possible. 
So I, I, I think it's, you know, malicious traffic drifts a lot. There's a lot of variety in it. But um, I think generally normal traffic is not like that, right? Like, um, you know, you go to Facebook a lot or whatever. <laughs> Use OS X a lot. So, I, I mean, those signals are in there. And, like, um, this thing is going to pick them out if they're there. So I know that your example, you focused a lot on, uh, on the proxy traffic. But is, what other kind of logs have you focused on? And have you tried to, let's say, cross-correlate between different log sites to get, let's say, a higher positive rate? Yeah, we haven't actually looked at, it for this, um, the correlation of the logs. Uh, we're, again, like we're trying to be a demo crossed with a real tool. Mm -hmm. So we kind of scoped it down to like, you're going to look at a, a log. Although it's it's perfectly possible that you might take, like with bro data, a lot of the things in bro are explicitly linked by their IDs. So if you actually looked at the bro H logs, they actually have like file IDs that correspond to files that were uploaded or downloaded. You could think of pasting those two together and saying I'm going to augment the HTTP log with the information about the files that went on that, um, that connection and then see how that affected it. So for example, if I'm downloading an EXE file, maybe that's a little bit more malicious than, or, or, or maybe you would find like the JPEG that says .jpeg, but the mime type that wrote assigned to it actually said like .dll. It looks at the bytes. Uh, and that might be a useful feature that would help classify that as well. Uh, we just did not do that because we were trying to keep it more straightforward and simple to make it easier to understand because it's getting started with incident detection. So this is the kind of thing that the product itself is, is doing. Is that what you're saying? I can neither confirm nor deny, Senator. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, I guess a good observation. Like, these, this is log at a time, uh, and we're trying to classify logs. And we really, what I think you're asking is, um, we really want to try to classify behavior of various things, like IP addresses or users. And to do that, you have to do correlation. You have to do like um, modeling and things like that. So that's, yeah, that's the kind of thing that we do. Uh, that's, that's the GitHub logo. logo. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're squirrel, not GitHub. We're squirrel. We have the acorn because we're yeah, not worried about that. Yeah. GitHub is a cat octopus, right? Like yeah, it is. Yeah. Cat, yeah. Cat yeah, ours is like an acorn that's also a shield. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we paid those guys for something. Good morning, Mr. Bill. Well, if, that's, if there's no more questions, then thanks very much. And, uh,